welcome. Welcome back first to welcome first timers and welcome back to the other ones. If you've been here for a while, that's great to see you here. We're thrilled that you're here. If you have come here to worship in the past or Easter, you know that I've talked about who? Who have I thought about? Jesus, of yeah, course. Yeah. Jesus, of course. His death, his resurrection, what it meant back then, what it means for us today, for each one of you who are here also. And we've studied about the crucifixion. We've studied about what happened after the crucifixion. We've studied about those who witnessed, who saw Jesus after he had risen. The proof was there that Jesus was alive. But this morning, I want to look at one small part of the Easter story that often we overlook. And it's the first time that the disciples were gathered together and saw Jesus after he had risen. A few of them had seen Jesus after he rose, that's true. But the scripture this morning shows that Jesus appeared when all of the disciples were there together. And how Jesus acted there, what Jesus said when he was there, that's critical. And it had a huge impact upon them, the disciples, but also has an impact for us as well. And that's what we'll be looking at this morning. So a little background before we get into the scripture. Jesus and his disciples, those who were left, because most of the people had already abandoned Jesus. But those who were left, they witnessed and they saw the trial. They saw his arrest, his beatings. They saw him suffering. They saw him crucified on the cross. And Jesus died and he was innocent. He hadn't broken any law. He had done nothing wrong, completely innocent. He hadn't sinned, nothing. But our penalty for sin is death and he was willing to do that for us. And after Jesus had died, of course his disciples were thinking that they were next. The Jewish authorities had already arrested Jesus. That meant the time was coming when they would be arrested as well. So those disciples hid. And it's interesting, where did they hide? They hid in the same room where Jesus had been with them, that gathering, just before the Passover one. And of course now, we can read the story. Some of us grew up hearing the story. And we can look back, and it makes us wonder, why were they afraid? And we know how the story ends. But back then, they didn't know. They didn't know what was going to happen next. And Jesus had taught them. And he had promised them. He had explained to the disciples. In Mark chapter 9, someone will betray me. Jesus is telling them, someone will betray me. They will come to kill me. But after three days, I will rise. And they had seen Jesus tell this story over and over. But they didn't really get it. They didn't fully understand. Someone is dead. It's going to rise and be alive again. It was just too fantastic for them to comprehend. They couldn't fully understand. The religious leaders at that time, some of them did teach about the resurrection. But the body, the physical resurrection, not yet. And also, I'm sure after Jesus was arrested, they were thinking that was our leader. It was depressing for them. Jesus was supposed to come and reign over Israel. Jesus was supposed to become our king. 
our king, the king for Israel. But they totally missed what scripture was teaching there. So now the Lord was arrested and found guilty and killed. And they were afraid, of course. Meaning what's going to happen next? They didn't know. Now, if you look at scripture, Says on the evening of the first day of the week, the translation says it was Sunday. The first day of the week, in the evening, the <coughs> disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as Jesus spoke, he showed them the wounds on his hands and his side. The disciples, when they saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. And again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So it's Sunday night. Sunday evening. And Jesus has already risen from the dead that morning. Peter and John, two of his disciples, had gone to the tomb and found it to be empty. Mary Magdalene had seen and talked with Jesus. When she met him, she didn't recognize him. And really, that's Jesus. <coughs> but now Jesus had appeared before the group. And this was the first time the whole group had seen Jesus together. But notice three things that are happening here. There's three things. First of all, verse 19, it says the doors were locked. They were locked. Does that mean Jesus knocked to open the door to get in? No, it doesn't say that. They were locked. Jesus was just there. Jesus was not a ghost. He was not a ghost. He had physically risen. He had flesh, muscle, bone. He showed them his hands. Look, it's me, he said. I'm here. My body. Even though the door was locked, Jesus was able to enter the room. He was there. And I thought about that closed door, doors being locked, and it made me think about our lives. Quite often we have doors that are closed within our lives. We have that too, which means we have barriers, we have struggles, we have challenges that we just can't let go of. We can't get through them. It's frustrating, they're just there. Maybe it's a past experience. Maybe it's a relationship experience. Something that happened when we were growing up. Or maybe something that just happened. But it's a barrier. We can't get past it. We can't get around it. And it's constantly there. And you know, sometimes I do counseling. And sometimes during counseling, I get to a point where I just can't help that person. Believe it or not, it's true. Quite often, I'm like stuck. I can't help that person. 
I tell them I'm sorry because that person is resistant to help. Maybe they have a blind spot, something they don't recognize. Or it's their history, it's just too much, it's too complicated, too much baggage to unpack. Whatever the reason, I can't get through to them. But Jesus can. Jesus can get through whatever it is, how much you're struggling, how much you're hurting, how much you're resisting. Jesus can get through that, and he can reach you, and he can heal you completely. Those doors, barriers, struggles, challenges, pains, failures, losses. Jesus is amazing in that way, and he won't be stopped by that. So the door was locked. And secondly, if you notice, the disciples that were there were afraid, obviously. But again, they saw their leader killed. They witnessed that. And the Jewish authorities were searching for them. So their fear was totally understandable. It made sense. And where was Jesus? He was right there. He was right there with them. Think about your biggest fear. What is your biggest fear? Think for just a minute and just visualize your biggest fear. Is it failure? Are you afraid of failure? Maybe failure as a mother, failure as a father, failure as someone in your job. Maybe you're afraid of abandonment. Maybe if you are a believer, maybe if you have a fear that your children will go up and reject God, rebel against God. Or maybe you're afraid that now that you've become older, you're going to look back on your life and realize, my life was really meaningless. You know, God's people cry out in fear, and he comes. He is there. After 41 years as a Christian myself, I cry out many times, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Jesus, I don't understand what's going on here. Jesus, I can't predict. I don't know. Oh, it's just overwhelming. But what is amazing, Jesus doesn't wait for you. He doesn't wait for you to make sure everything in your life is perfect and everything's worked out. Well, this is done. This is done. Went to church five times, read the Bible last week. Okay, now I'll come and help them. That's not what Jesus does. He doesn't wait for you to grow your faith. Well, first I want to make sure that he trusts me completely, then I'll go help him out. That is not what Jesus does. He helps us overcome our fears. He promises. Look in this Isaiah. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up. He's there. The last one more thing about verse 19. Jesus came, and he stood there with them, with the disciples. And he said, I am here with you. I am alive, and I am your Lord and your Savior. And that might not seem like a big deal, something that's really important, but it is big. 
Jesus wanted all the disciples around to see, to see him, to believe in him, to trust in him. Jesus wants the same from you today. He wants you to believe and trust. He wants you to know without a doubt that he is Lord, that he is the Savior for the world, but also that he is the Lord and Savior for you personally. That you need him. You may not realize it right now, but you need him. When you love him with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, you know that's my prayer for you right now, that each one of you today will do that. All of your doubts, your fears, your struggles, your resistance will all be taken away. And finally, you will admit, I may not understand it fully. I didn't grow up in church. But there's just something. I need you. And that's what happened within that passage. So now I want to notice Jesus' comments. We saw what happened, and now Jesus' comments, what he said. Verses 21 and 22. Jesus mentions three things. Really, Jesus offers three gifts. They're actually gifts that he offers for his followers. First of all, twice Jesus offered peace. Peace to you. That was not just greeting like, hello, peace out. It wasn't like that at all. It meant shalom. Shalom. And often the translation says, oh, it means peace, but it means so much more than that. It means rescue. <coughs> it means blessing. It means contentment. It means the fear is gone. It means that I am there with you. I make sure that everything is good. And he offered peace. Remember again, in that moment, everything was fine, everything was satisfactory with everyone? No, that was not the case. Jesus just reminded them that what he had been teaching all along, it's a short lesson. But he repeated it over and over. In John chapter 14, verse 37, he said, My peace I give to you. My death, my resurrection means that now you can have true peace. Peace with God. First of all, and most importantly, peace with God. And I know some of you might think... <coughs> I don't have any problem with God. But I want to let you know that God has a problem with you. The problem is sin. <coughs> well, I'm not that bad. Well, yeah. <coughs> we are. All of us are that bad. And I'm not, I don't mean to just talk about behavior, you know, once in a while you lie, sometimes you cheat, you get angry. I'm not talking about that. I mean, deep down within your heart, you are fighting and fighting and struggling and rejecting his righteousness, his goodness. We reject God. And any offense, separates us from God. Any offense separates us from God. And some of you who are married, some of you who I'm older, this is it. Some of you who have a significant 
significant other, have a significant relationship where you trust each other, you love each other, and then you find out that your partner, your friend, mother or sister or whatever, that relationship was all based on a lie. A lie. Oh, the damage is horrific. It fractures your relationship. Any sin fractures the relationship between yourself and God. It damages us. God cannot tolerate sin. And again, you might think that everything's fine, but it's not fine. And that's why the Lord God Almighty sent his son. Our sin was traded off for his righteousness. He gave that to us. And when you accept, when you believe, Jesus did that for me. From there on out, God sees who? Who does he see? When he looks at you, he sees a perfect, beautiful son or daughter. And you have peace with God for eternity. But also, Jesus' death and resurrection means that that peace with the disciples, with each other as well. You know, the world really tries and tries and tries to resolve conflicts. They've done this forever, since the beginning of time. They look for peace. They try to resolve conflicts. Billions of dollars have been spent on this. Wars have happened because of this, where they try to end conflict. They try to find peace. In 1940s, when they created the United Nations, that will bring peace to the world. And it didn't. They came up with the Peace Corps during the 1960s. Oh, we will spread peace throughout the world. And that didn't work. And it doesn't mean it didn't help. They did good work. But genuine peace didn't happen. Countries today are still battling with each other. North Korea, South Korea still hate each other. Pakistan and India still hate each other, still. Groups have conflicts still, race issues. There's splits still. Divorce destroys marriage still. Families fall apart still. Is there peace? Where is it? And when we have peace with God, we can have true peace with each other. We can become a family. And it's not just a label. We have relationships. And those relationships with God, that's what he has always intended for us, his people, to have that relationship. Jesus Christ died and lives again, resurrected, and that was for our common unity. That is the only priority. Many times in the past you've heard politics, philosophies, prejudices, principles, movements, your deaf community, all those things, they can't give you true peace. <coughs> because all of those things, and all of those things are nice, yes, but they cannot heal the relationship and the fractured relationship between you and God. Only Jesus can do that. It's his peace. It's his offer to you. Peace is the first gift. The second one is power. Again, in verse 22, Jesus breathed on them. And exactly what that looks like, we don't know. I mean, did he actually blow on them? We don't know. But he breathed on them, and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
And if you go back to John chapter 14, Jesus had told the disciples, I'm leaving, he said. And of course, they were taken aback. Wait a minute, you're leaving? But why? Where are you going? How? What's going on? He said, I'm leaving you, but I'm not making you an orphan. I'm not. Meaning, I'm not just abandoning you to try to get through life by yourself. I'm not doing that. I will send my spirit. He will live within you, and he will guide you and protect you. Therefore, if we jump over to Acts chapter 1, where Jesus left and went back to heaven to be with the Father, and the Spirit came. And from there on out, Christians developed, achieved. It was amazing. The old sins of our lives were done. They were finished. And finally, we could understand and follow and live according to his teachings. The Bible became clear. It made sense. It convicted me. All oh, this is for me. During difficult times and struggles, persecution, frustrations, anxiety, we could bear through that because the Spirit was there to help me. In the past, that selfishness, that pride, gone. It's gone. And I can love people, even though sometimes it's not easy to love. Sometimes it's not easy. But now, my heart is open to that. It was like, you know, putting on glasses where you can finally see the difference. I could proclaim to the world about Jesus. Because the Spirit had filled them. It had empowered them. It had encouraged them. And I know some of you, we have witnessed the Spirit, how it changes people's lives. We've seen that happen. First, within our own lives, we've seen it. And I've seen the Spirit heal relationships. I've seen the Spirit heal marriages. And I have seen scared people who have had no confidence become bold for Jesus. And I have seen people who in the past would never stand up and teach. Oh, I can't do that. I have seen them teach the Bible. I've seen it. I have seen Christians afraid to use the name of Jesus. Oh, here in church, fine. Within church, they say it with their friends. But out there in the world, they would never do that. And now... Those people are teaching, explaining, and sharing the love and the grace out there. And it's not self-confidence. It's not about that. Well, yeah, they became more confident. They became more confident for themselves. No, that's not it. That is his spirit working within their lives empowering people, empowering his people for his work. I've seen it. You have seen it. That peace, power, and then thirdly, in verse 21, the Father has sent me this is what Jesus said. The Father sent me, and now I, Jesus, am sending you. Your purpose is there. I am sending you. You who are here on earth, why are you here? Oh, some of you have thought about that. Well, I'm here, but... Really, why are you here? Whatever you believe or not, the point is that God created you 
He called you. He urges you to accept his son, his death, was for your forgiveness. And he wants you to have that relationship with the Father for eternity. But why? What's the purpose? Your purpose here is what? Do you really believe that God created you for your job? I know some of your jobs are great. But is that it? Some of you will say, I was made for this. Really? But I disagree with that. To earn more money, to raise your family, to retire comfortably, and that's it, then you die? That's it? I mean, there's nothing wrong with earning money, raising a family, retiring. That's all great. But that's your purpose for being here on earth? No. You are here for a reason. He created you for himself. And again, he created each one of you for himself. For loving, enjoying, worshiping, honoring him forever. That's why you're here. Beginning right now. He wants everyone to know and understand and believe Jesus said, I came to tell the world, you need God. And the only way to him is through me. Me, I am the only way to get back to God. Jesus said that. But now I'm leaving. And now I'm sending you to go and proclaim to the world about me the most important message in history. I want you to represent me. I want you to look at how I live and follow that. What I taught, I want you to understand, believe, and follow, and then teach the same thing. How I loved, I want you to love like that. And if you are a Christian, that is your purpose. That's why you're here. But if you don't follow Jesus, if you're not, quote, a Christian, I really want you to understand something this morning. God has shown you and given you so much of his patience, his kindness, his grace. And it's true, he has. He's given you time, time to think about this, all of this. Jesus, eternal life, sin, forgiveness. He's given you time, time for you to consider your spiritual life, time for you to really investigate for yourself. What was Jesus talking about? Is that true? He's given you time for that, time for you to wake up and realize, oh, yes, life. It's not about me. Life really is about us, us. And if I want forgiveness for my sins, if I want a relationship with God, if I want to live in heaven after I die, 
that I need Jesus. He's given you time. Don't waste it. Don't waste that time. <coughs> Take Jesus' healing, your relationship with the Father. Believe and accept his peace. Receive his power. And understand life and his purpose for life. sitting here this morning and you're wondering how do I tell the Father yes I want that relationship what do I do just quietly sit before the Lord now and pray pray I don't know how to pray and don't pray, talk. Talk to him. I realize that I am a sinner. I don't like that word. I don't like it. But yeah, the Bible says that I am a sinner because I have rejected you, meaning I have not lived for you thus far. I haven't committed my life, my breath, my hopes, my dreams. I haven't given that all to you yet. And now I realize that I want, I want life with you for eternity. So I am asking Jesus, your work on that cross, the blood that covered my sin, that forgiveness that was given to me, make me whole. I believe Jesus. You are my Lord. I believe that Jesus is my Savior. And I want to take you into my heart right now. You know, if that's your prayer, praise God. Praise God. Amen. They went sin was black as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh, the light shined among us, his glory revealed, living he loved me, dying he saved me.
said, you conquered death. That means that we don't have to die and stay there and suffer and suffer. You have taken that suffering for us. On the cross, it was done. And now we can live freely, fully empowered by your Holy Spirit. You have given us peace and a purpose. We thank you for this wonderful day where we can celebrate. And we ask now that you be with each person here. They have heard your word. Let them ponder it in their hearts and minds. If there are any doubts, any concerns, that they would find someone they can read scripture and learn, but that they would find a way to be in a relationship with you. And we thank you, Jesus. Amen.